This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the eighth episode, cannot believe it, of the Hooved Animal Humane Society's Saturday Seminar Series. This, week, this month, we are talking about the equine eye, and we have with us Dr. Amber LaBelle from Bright Light Veterinary Eye Care in, help me pronounce that name. <laughs> Ottawa. Let's just go with Ottawa. I live in the capital of Canada, Ottawa, in the province of Ontario, about Wonderful. four hours north of Syracuse. Okay, great. And we will just let you take it away. We are so happy to have you. You are our first international speaker, although we look forward to hearing about your Illinois connection as we go through your presentation. So I am Fabulous. going to make you the presenter and away we go. Thank you so much. Okie dokie. So let me pull up my slide deck here. Y'all can see my slides okay? I have a thumbs up, Wait, make sure. Okay. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for that warm welcome. Thank you for this invitation. Uh, welcome to I-L-L-I-N-I -L -L -I -I with a little bit of a different twist on the eye because you got it. We're going to be talking about horse eyes today. Before we jump into that, um, I know it's a little weird to have like someone talking to you from a computer screen and like it's a little easy to feel disconnected. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself so that we can be friends and so that we can learn together over the next hour or so. So my name is Amber. My pronouns are she and hers. I grew up in Arizona in the middle of the Southwest desert where we grow amazing alfalfa hay, but there's no pasture. And yes, I've literally jumped over a cactus before when I was young and silly and foolish. Uh, I grew up as a three-day eventer. I went to veterinary school because my trainer was really honest with me. And she said, look, kid, you're never going to the Olympics, but you'd be a great vet. And that was the day that I knew that veterinary medicine was the way that I was going to be able to work with horses for the rest of my life, which was the only thing I wanted to do <laughs> was work with horses. I went to vet school at UC Davis in California. I then moved to the East Coast and was in like the Jersey, New York, Connecticut region for a while. And that's where I fell in love with ophthalmology. And one of the things that I really love about equine ophthalmology is it feels really high stakes. So in the bottom corner of the screen here, these two little mean mugs, these are my pugs, uh, Bruni and Sheldon. They're over here in the background. They're probably gonna zoom bomb us here at some point. You know, like when a pug loses their vision, it's not that big a deal. Like what do pugs do for a living? They snort, they fart, they eat, they snuggle, like, like the pug life is a pretty low stakes life, right? And they can do all of the things they love to do, even when they have poor vision. On the other hand, horses are a prey species and they're big. And when they're scared, they can hurt you and they can hurt themselves. So one of the things that got me really interested in equine ophthalmology is this idea that vision is really important for horses, for their safety and for ours. So when I was on the East Coast and falling in love with ophthalmology, I was fortunate enough to get accepted into a residency program at none other than the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And so I did my residency training there. When I finished, I went and taught at the Ohio State University, where I learned the word the is very important. And then Illinois stole me back, and I was actually a faculty member at the University of Illinois for several years. Then I had my first kid, and as much as I loved my teaching job, I realized that I couldn't mom the way I wanted to and continue my academic career. So down here in the right-hand corner, these are um, my two kiddos. Uh, this was taken this past winter, and uh, this is literally the skating rink we built in our backyard. It gets really cold here <laughs> in Canada. Um, my husband is from this area and my kids are dual citizens. And so we make our home now in Ottawa. But this picture here on the upper right is actually me 
teaching at the University of Illinois in January of this year. So I actually taught the third year ophthalmology course to the veterinary students and it was a total delight and I realized there's so much teaching that I can do on the computer. So if I can teach a veterinary student how to examine the eye on Zoom, I can definitely help you learn some stuff about horse eyes today. My practice, Bright Light Veterinary Eye Care, I see uh, both cat and dog patients, but I also see horse patients on the farm. And although I currently do not have a horse of my own, uh, I get my good horsey vibes from all of the patients that I get to see. So before we start talking about eyes, I want you to understand a little bit about what is veterinary ophthalmology. So in order to become a veterinarian, you have to go to most of the time, four years of undergrad at a university, and then four years of veterinary school. So that's eight years to become an equine veterinarian who um, comes out to your farm and helps with your lacerations and your colics and your new foals. If you wanna go on and specialize in a particular subject in um, veterinary medicine like ophthalmology, most people do another one to two years of internship and then another three to four years of residency on top of that. So it's a lot of education and a very, very long road in order to um, become a veterinary ophthalmologist. And the reason it takes such a long time is because there's a lot to know, <laughs> like a lot to know. I am not gonna bore you with the whole content of veterinary ophthalmology today. We are going to focus on horse eyes. And we're gonna start in the place where I start with my veterinary students. We're gonna start with the anatomy and the physiology of the eye. Because if you understand the parts of the eye and how those parts work, you'll be able to understand when your horse is having an eye problem and you're going to be better at recognizing that and getting help in the appropriate amount of time. We're also gonna talk about some of the more common eye diseases that affect horses in central Illinois. And then I'm gonna give you some tips for how you can keep your horse's eyes healthier. And then of course, we'll have questions at the end. So let's get started with the anatomy. In the upper right here is an actual equine eye that has been transected and laid open on the half shell. And so all of the things that we see here in this diagram, we're going to identify in this actual equine eye. So the cornea, where my arrow is, is the clear windshield at the front of the eye. So you can think of it like the windshield of your car. It's clear and it kind of holds the front part of the eye together. Behind that is a fluid-filled space. That fluid-filled space is called the anterior chamber. And behind that is the colorful tissue inside the eye. That's called the iris. Everybody's iris is a different color. So like my irises are green. Most horses have a brown iris, but we can also see some color variation in that that we're going to talk about in a minute. Horses have this interesting little lumpy, bumpy tissue at the top of their pupil. The pupil is the hole. So that black circle you see inside your eye is actually a hole in the middle of the iris. And horses have these neat little lumpy bumpies on the top called corpora nigra. We're going to look at some pictures of those in just a minute. Behind the iris is the focusing mechanism of the eye, and that's called the lens. That's what allows you to focus up on things that are close up and also on things that are far away. And behind that is this big gel-filled space called the vitreous. It's basically like eye jello, if you will. And then all the way here at the very, very back of the eye is this thin tissue that's called the retina. The retina is where the sensitive light sensing cells are. And then you can kind of see up here how this is kind of shiny and yellow and green. That shiny yellow green is a structure under the retina called the tapetum. It kind of acts like, um, like a mirror to help reflect extra light and improve vision in dim lighting conditions. So this is what it looks like if you could see inside. This is what it looks like when you look at your horse from the outside. So fun fact, horses only have eyelashes on their upper eyelids and not on their lower eyelids. And you can see this nice, beautiful, clear cornea here. And you might notice down here in the corner, there's this little bit of tissue. If you use your finger and gently push through the eyelid and push back on the eye, you'll get this whole piece of tissue to pop up here. And this is called the third eyelid. So cats and dogs and horses and birds and ferrets have three eyelids. They have their upper and lower eyelid like humans do, but they also have this third eyelid that kind of lives in the corner. 
and acts like a windshield wiper over the surface of the eye. I'm picking up just a little bit of background noise I'm noticing, um, and I might ask if anybody uh, has their mic on, maybe you might consider turning your mic off so that we're not going to pick up any background noise that could be distracting. So that third eyelid usually lives down here, kind of tucked into the corner like this. So normally, um, the edge of the third eyelid has some brown pigment on it, so you can't see it very well. Um, some horses have a naturally pink edge of their third eyelid that might make that third eyelid look a little more prominent. And that's just a normal variation, A-OK, -okay, no problem. So you can see this horse has a brown iris, and here's the hole in the middle, the pupil. And then do you guys see these where my arrow is right here, these little lumpy bumpies up here? Those are the corpora nigra. Corpora nigra are a little bit like noses in that they can vary from person to person. Some people have really big, long noses. Some people have little short noses. Corpora nigra are kind of the same way. Some horses have really big, really fluffy corpora nigra, and some horses have itty bitty little corpora nigra. Uh, some horses also have itty bitty little corpora nigra at the bottom of their pupil as well. When we look into the pupil, you can see the reflection of the flash from my camera and also the nice clear lens. You can't actually see the retina at the back of the eye from the front without special equipment. So if you want to look at the retina, then you've got to, well, probably go to veterinary school and get trained in fundoscopy <laughs> because I don't think most people other than veterinarians are probably looking at the retina. So like I said, the iris comes in a couple variations of normal. Um, horses with spotted coats, so paints and appaloosas, will often have spotted irises. So in this uh, top left image, bottom left image, and bottom right image, you can see that all three of these horses have two colors in their iris. They've got brown, and then they've got either a very, very pale blue or maybe a little bit of a darker blue. This horse in the upper right has uh, such a light blue iris, it almost looks white. The $5 fancy word for having more than one iris color in your eye is heterochromia iridis. So you can use that at cocktail parties to impress your friends. That is a normal kind of variation. Now, it's also important to know that horse irises only really come in two colors brown and blue. And the blue can vary from really, really light, like almost white, to kind of the darker blue that we see in this horse's iris. Those are the only two colors horse irises can be, though. Horse irises cannot be yellow. They cannot be green. That is really important for you to know, because if you go out to the barn one day and your normally blue-eyed horse has yellow eyes, that's a problem. <laughs> That's a big problem, as a matter of fact, and you're going to need to get on the phone with a veterinarian ASAP. So to recap, horses only have two iris colors, blue and brown, and a mixture of those two colors. Every other color, red, yellow, green, purple, is something abnormal. This is what it looks like in the back of the eye if you use a special piece of equipment to look back there. This big pink jelly bean looking thing right here is actually the optic nerve. And the optic nerve is where all of the nerve cells of the retina come together and leave the eye and take the visual message up to the brain for processing. Fun fact, the part of your brain that does your vision is actually in the back of your head. Your visual cortex is back here. So like literally, we all have eyes in the back of our head, like literal eyes in the back of our head. I think that's pretty awesome. So let's talk about how the eye works, right? Now that, now that we've got some of these parts and we understand how the parts fit together, let's talk about the purpose of having an eye and how the eye actually works to create vision. So the whole purpose of having an eye is to take light information from the outside world up to the brain so that it can be processed as vision. And so the way that that works is we have bright light out in the universe bouncing around as mechanical energy, photons of light. You can kind of think of the light energy all around us like ping pong balls, like there's bajillions of itty bitty little ping pong balls of light bouncing around, bouncing around all around us. And so those ping pong balls of light have to enter the eye and travel to the retina. And in order for them to get to the retina, 
everything along that pathway needs to stay clear, okay? Every successive part within the eye works to focus the light and to organize the light so that by the time it comes back here to the retina, it's very precisely organized. And what happens in the retina is magic. It's absolute magic. So there are cells inside the retina that when those photons of light hit them, they release an electrical signal, right? So those cells actually take the mechanical form of light, little ping pong balls bouncing around all over the place, and they turn that into a zzz, an electrical signal. Electrical signals are how all of the nerves in your entire body, including the nerves in your brain, communicate. So then that electrical signal is then transmitted up the optic nerve. The optic nerve is actually not just one nerve, it's a bundle of many, 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 many nerves kind of bundled all together. And then that electrical signal goes up to your brain and is processed as vision. Like, isn't that so cool? Like, how could you not want to do veterinary ophthalmology for a living when you find out that's how the eye works? It's like magic, it's so awesome. So the whole point of having an eye is to take light information from the outside world, turn it into an electrical signal that then can be processed by your brain as vision. Therefore, our goal in keeping our horse's eyes healthy is to make sure that light can get into the eye in an organized way and that then the structures of the eye, like the retina and the optic nerve, can do their job transforming light information. Why does it matter? Why, why do our horses need to see? Well, we talked at the beginning, horses are a prey species, right? And they have a pretty strong flight response. Some of them have a fight response, but most of them have a flight response. And so when our horses do not have normal vision, there is increased risk to the health of the horse and the humans around them. If that horse tries to activate flight mode and take off and can't see where they're going very well. Also, we use horses for really visually demanding tasks, you know, whether we're talking about cutting horses and um, sorting horses, whether we're talking about three day eventing horses that run very, very fast and leap over large objects that do not fall down <laughs> if you hit them or whether we're talking polo ponies who have to just do some really amazing navigation. We ask our horses to perform very visually demanding tasks as part of the jobs that they do with us. And therefore, keeping their eyes as healthy as possible and maintaining normal vision is really super important. I have to confess something here. I don't actually know what horses see. I really don't. The hardest part of my job as a veterinary ophthalmologist is trying to figure out what my patients see. Since horses can't read the eye chart and tell me, you know, is it fuzzier now? Is it clearer now? Since I don't speak horse, or at least the kind of horse language that allows me to figure out what horses see, what we're left with instead is relying on indirect measures of vision in order to assess horses vision so we can look at their anatomy we can look at what we know about the physiology of their eye and we can infer some things about what normal horse vision should be like so one thing that we know about horses is that their eyes are set roughly on the sides of their head right? So if you compare like a human where our eyes are directly at the front of our head, horses' eyes are relatively offset on the sides of their head. And that creates some really interesting impacts on their vision. So there is a part, uh, there's a, a field in front of them where they use both eyes to see. And when you're using both eyes to see, it's easier to accept, uh, assess depth. And it also gives you increased visual acuity because you're using the power of both eyes. Horses then have a field to the side of them where they're only using one eye to see. And what that effectively creates, you know, if we think about this in terms of, you know, degrees and clock hours, horses can see almost 360 degrees around themselves by using one eye or the other, which is really wild because humans, you know, we've only got a visual field that's a little less than 180 degrees. 
horses do also have a blind spot that it is directly behind them. So, you know, that thing we all got taught in the barn as kids that you shouldn't walk right up behind a horse. Well, th this is part of why, <laughs> because they literally can't see you when you're immediately behind them. So the most dangerous place to stand is immediately behind a horse for the reason of the way their skull is shaped and the way that their eyes are positioned. What else do we know about how horses see? Well, we know that equine vision broadly is maximized not for hunting. So um, predator species, like let's say, I don't know, that pug sleeping on my floor over there that fancies himself a, a very fierce predator. We know that predatory species have their vision optimized to be able to recognize things that are moving quickly and to be able to track quick moving objects. Just think about like a, a hawk hunting a mouse on the ground or a cat, you know, hunting a chipmunk out in the barn. They've got to be able to track things that are moving very, very quickly. Horse vision seems to be optimized for defense. So not for the tracking of prey, like what do horses eat? They eat hay, they eat grass, like, you know, grass is not like getting up and running away from the horse. So instead, equine vision seems to be optimized to protect them from predators rather than for the hunting and catching of prey. That means that generally they see things better that are um, moving rather than things that are absolutely still. So theoretically, a moving plastic bag is going to be more scary than a plastic bag that's sitting still on the ground. Why some horses still think that rocks on the ground are scary? <laughs> I don't have an answer for that one. <laughs> they also have much better night vision than humans do. They have several features of their eye, including that tapetum. Remember that pretty yellow green tapetum that I showed you at the beginning? That acts to help reflect more light. And by reflecting more light, um, it improves their visual acuity at night. Now, we know that most horses don't need glasses. The reason that humans need glasses is because of refractive error. And a refractive error is just a fancy way of saying your eye doesn't focus on things as well as it should. In several large studies assessing refraction and refractive error in horses, it turns out it's actually really, really, really uncommon. So if horses were people, most of them wouldn't eat glasses and most of them would have pretty close to 20-20 vision. They do have a blind spot already, which we've already talked about. A really common question that I get is, do horses see color? Yes, yes, horses can see color. Yes, dogs can also see color. Yes, cats can also see color. But horse color vision isn't like human color vision. So, the reason that we call human vision trichromatic is because there's three different types of cells in our retina that perceive color. Horses only have two types of color sensing cells in their eye. And so their ability to perceive um, reds and oranges is definitely not as good as humans. There is, based on some anatomic research, the supposition that horses might see similarly to male humans with red-green color blindness. So this is a pretty famous image that I took out of the recently published equine ophthalmology textbook. And this image is, the top two images are kind of what humans see in the world. And the bottom two images, again, based on anatomic studies are what we think maybe the visual world looks like to horses. So it's definitely grayer. It's definitely more along kind of like a pastel -y spectrum. Um, the reason that this is probably important is when we're designing things that horses are jumping over, taking into account what is high contrast for them versus what is probably low contrast for them, I think informs fence design for hunters and show jumpers and three-day adventures. Okay, so we've done all of this talking about normal up to now. Now we're going to shift our focus a little bit and we're going to talk about eye diseases of horses. Why are horses always hurting their eyes? Well, that's a good question. The the equine eye is very large. It's it's a big eye compared to like like say a dog or a cat or even most birds, and they're pretty prominent. And also, 
horses are just like really nosy. <laughs> They're really nosy. One of the most common diseases that we see in horses is eyelid lacerations. And eyelid lacerations probably happen because horses are putting their faces in places where they don't belong and then trying to run backwards when something scares them and creating an eyelid laceration. Eyelid lacerations are always something you want to call your veterinarian about. Always, always, always. They're not necessarily something that has to get fixed in the next hour, but you definitely want a veterinarian to look. Do not, under any circumstances, cut off any of that tissue. I don't care how black it is or how stinky it is or how cold and dead you think it is. Do not cut any tissue off of a horse's eyelid until a veterinarian has assessed that. And the reason I say that is because eyelid tissue has remarkable regenerative abilities and healing abilities, but if you cut it off, there's only so much eyelid to go around. And unfortunately, there's only so much eyelid available to cover the surface of the eye. So no cutting eyelid tissue off. You know that old expression, no foot, no horse? The ophthalmology equivalent of that is no eyelid, no eye, right? Eyelids are super, super important for protecting the surface of the eye, for removing dust and debris from the surface of the eye. And it doesn't take very much going wrong with an eyelid to end up with hairs poking in the wrong direction that then can create ulcerations on the cornea, damage the cornea and impact vision. So even if it's a teeny little thing and you're like, I don't know if this needs any stitches, you wanna get a veterinarian to have a look at these. There's a really couple simple things you can do to prevent eyelid lacerations. These old school buckets with the little upward metal hooks, these things are the worst for hurting horses' eyelids. So doing something like buying the new fancy ones that don't have these hooks or just duct taping around these if you've got a bunch of them on the farm will go a long way towards preventing eyelid lacerations on your farm. Eyelid tumors, unfortunately, are fairly common in horses. Sarcoids are a type of skin tumor that can be hard to treat on other parts of the body, but darn near impossible to treat around the eye, just because there's not a lot of extra skin to work with around the eye and around the face. Sometimes we'll inject these with um, different chemotherapy agents. Sometimes we'll use lasers. These can be treated, but any non-healing wound or lumpy bumpy of, of the skin around the eye is definitely something you should get a veterinarian to look at because you might be like oh yeah you know he just rubbed his face on the fence no big deal but when this thing still isn't healed three weeks later and you know as a good horse person that most little cuts get healed up much sooner than that that's when you might be suspicious like oh gosh this could be a sarcoid and you want to have a veterinarian have a look at it the most common eye tumor in horses is squamous cell carcinoma. So squamous cell carcinoma is a form of skin tumor. And in horses, it can affect the third eyelid. It can also affect the eyelid skin itself, or it can affect the conjunctiva, which is the white tissue around the eye. Squamous cell carcinomas can be really aggressive, they can cause a lot of tissue damage. And when they get very big, they can be hard to treat. So this is the part where I'm gonna tell you a sad story. This horse's name is Shaker. And he was one of my patients when I worked at the University of Illinois. And he was owned by the nicest woman on the entire planet. And Shaker had a squamous cell carcinoma of his third eyelid. And he had that squamous cell carcinoma removed. And unfortunately, his owner didn't receive good instructions that that needed to get rechecked at least twice a year. It's really, really important that if your horse has a squamous cell carcinoma removed, that they get cancer checks twice a year. Because unfortunately, when I met Shaker, his squamous cell carcinoma had returned. And it had grown deep, 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 deep into his eye socket. And despite heroic treatment, 
and an absolute heroic effort on the part of his owner who loved him so, 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 so much. Unfortunately, that cancer spread and it spread across his head and it spread into his brain. And unfortunately, we had to euthanize Schaefer. And I, I shot this portrait for his owner shortly before I euthanized him. And I promised her that any opportunity that I ever had for the rest of my career to educate horse owners about squamous cell carcinoma, that I would do that and that I would do it for Shaker. So I'm going to back up a slide. I want to show you some of these pictures again. Okay. Squamous cell carcinomas can look like pink lumpy bumpies. They can look like a wound that's not healing at the edge of the eyelid. They can look like big white lumpy bumpies. Any kind of lumpy bumpy tissue in and around the eye absolutely needs to get seen by a veterinarian. And any horse that gets treated for squamous cell carcinoma needs to have twice a year cancer checks to make sure that everything is going okay. Because our ability to intervene and be successful is far greater when we catch these tumors when they're very, very small than we do when they're very, very large. Shaker, you were such a good boy and I love you every day. Okay, let's move from the eyelid to the surface of the cornea. Remember the cornea is like the clear windshield at the surface of the eye. Corneal ulcers are pretty darn common in horses. Here's one that's associated with the eyelid rolling in in about a six day old foal. And here's a big giant one in the middle of the cornea. Now, the way that you're going to diagnose, that your veterinarian is going to diagnose a corneal ulcer is by putting this bright yellow green dye in the eye called fluorescein. And that dye sticks to the place where there's an ulcer on the cornea. You can think of an ulcer on the cornea kind of like, you know, if you're running down the barn aisle in shorts and Crocs, which you shouldn't be doing because Crocs are not running shoes, <laughs> and you fall down and you skin your knee. So that's what a corneal ulcer is like. It's like some tissue has been scraped off of the surface of the eye. Unfortunately, these wounds are highly susceptible to infection because the cornea is warm and it's wet and it's full of delicious protein and collagen, which are things bacteria and fungus love to eat. While many, many corneal ulcers heal on their own, unfortunately, sometimes they can become very, very complicated. And so all four of these images are horses who started out with simple, superficial, no big deal, little ulcer on the surface of the eye. But unfortunately, those can go bad really, really fast. So anytime you see this kind of yellowish, whitish cloudiness on the surface of the eye, we need to be very worried about infection. And unfortunately, because bacteria can literally dissolve the cornea, they have these enzymes that they use to attack corneal tissue. So in this bottom left image here, like look, this is literally the cornea dissolving and becoming a liquid gel and just bleh, dripping off the surface of the eye. This is the part where I'm really sad that we're like not in person together because this is the part where many people go, ew! And then I can tell who's really grossed out by this versus the people like me who are like, ooh, that's so cool. <laughs> So these are all, anytime you go out to the barn and the surface of the eye is dripping onto the eyelid, that is an emergency and you need to get a veterinarian on the phone right away. The way that we treat these, sometimes we just end up putting medicine directly into the eye from the tube, but we've got some cool technology as well. So we actually have these tubes. You can see it coming up here through the main, over the pole and then it inserts underneath the upper eyelid. That's called a lavage system. So it's a way that you can inject liquid eye medication through this tube and into the eye. Most simple and superficial corneal ulcers will just put medicine into the eye directly, but for some of these more complicated ones, these kinds of lavage tubes can be really, really, really helpful. They also can be helpful in horses that are difficult to handle. Some of these horses do need surgical treatments in order for their ulcers to heal. 
The problem with losing tissue off of the cornea, like let's say bacteria is eating that tissue, is the horse cornea isn't very thick. It's really not. And so you can only lose so much tissue before you get a hole in the eye. And so sometimes these horses need surgical stabilization or grafting of their cornea in order to plug up the hole. Now, our goal of treatment is always for the horse to be able to go back to what they were doing before. So this is a before and after of a horse I actually treated in Illinois, where this horse had a terrible, deep, yucky, yucky, yucky corneal uh, wound and infection, had pus inside its eye, and we put this big, beautiful graft on. Now you might notice, while we were successful in saving the eye, this horse's vision won't be what it was before, right? Look how we can see the pupil, like see how we see the edge of the pupil over here, but we can't see the pupil over here. If you can't see in, that means the horse can't see out clearly. So while these kinds of surgeries can be really excellent for saving the eye, if the horse has to do a really visually demanding job, like let's say be a child's three-day eventing horse, not all of these horses are necessarily gonna go back to the job that they do. That being said, if their job is to bop around in a pasture in Southern Illinois, even after a major surgical procedure, some of those horses go back to doing their jobs just super duper fine. This is a horse that had this big, nasty abscess here in its cornea. Um, it spent quite a long time in the hospital, but eventually got back to her job of uh, playing around with her little boy, which was great. Horses, like we've talked about, are often poking their heads into places where they shouldn't be. Uh, they're also often poking things into themselves that they shouldn't be. This is an example of a horse that's got this gigantic, huge thorn stuck into its cornea. And here's a horse that poked his head on, I think it was a, like a screw or something sticking out of a wall and actually got like a full thickness wound into the surface of the eye, which is not great, not great. Okay, I'm gonna, before we move on to equine recurrent uveitis and kind of wind down to some of the end of this, I am going to pop up the chat here and see if we have any question. So let's see, I'm glad that you guys are getting some fabulous weather. Um, there's a question, is it known if horses detect UV light by eye? Not to the best of my knowledge, but that's a good question. I will double check and look that up, but I don't think so. Um, Alina Vale? Like Dr. Alina Vale? Alina, are you there? Is that you? Really? No, no way. Um, what color rail would be easiest for a horse to see? So high contrast things. So black and white, for sure, or something that's in high visual contrast with um, the ambient background. So like, for example, a white fence on green grass is gonna have really high contrast. Um, but a white fence when there's, you know, like six feet of snow on the ground in the middle of the winter going to be low contrast. So I, I think it has to be, um, oh my gosh, Dr. Vale, I am so excited that you're here. Dr. Vale and I knew each other when I was a veterinary student at the University of California, Davis. You stay on afterwards. I want to say hi to you, okay? Um, so I, I think the name of the game is like, really really high contrast and knowing that like if you painted like for example um a stadium jumping pole like with red and green stripes that that's going to have basically no contrast for the horse so the contrast here the better thanks for these great questions you guys i love this okay let's let's talk a little bit about the disease that many people know as moon blindness so moon blindness is more correctly known as equine recurrent uveitis. Uveitis is just a fancy word for inflammation inside of the eye, okay? So here's what we think the cycle of equine recurrent uveitis is. So you're a horse, that's the equine part of the disease. You have your immune system attacking the inside of the eye. And when that happens, that this is the actual uveitis part, the tissue inside the eye gets damaged. 
And unfortunately, your immune system then sees that damaged tissue and goes, ah, this is a foreign invader attack. And then you've got the immune system attacking the eye. And then the eye tissues are getting damaged by the immune system, which then causes the immune system to recognize the eye as something to attack, which makes it go on attack, which damages it, which makes it think it needs to attack, which then it goes on attack and then it gets damaged. And you see the cycle goes round and round and round. That's the recurrent part of equine recurrent uveitis. Now, the million dollar question about ERU, that's what we call it for short, is what is the inciting cause that starts this? And the answer to that question is, we're not sure. We're honestly not sure. There is loads and loads of research going on around the whole world about ERU, and we still not have identified a single precise inciting cause. There is some thought that leptospirosis, so infection with a bacteria called leptospira, may be the inciting cause in some regions and some cases. There is also a genetic susceptibility in some breeds of horses, particularly some warm bloods in Northern Europe. There's a coat color predispos predisposition that we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, there's some thought that maybe trauma or other infections might be involved. The honest answer is we're not exactly sure, but luckily in 2002, even without understanding all of the mechanisms of this eye disease, we've got some pretty reasonable treatments at hand. So what does it look like when a horse has ERU? So there's kind of two ways that most horse owners notice ERU. So the form that's hardest to detect is when it starts in the back of the eye. And these images are not as pretty as I would like them to be. I must have done some color readjustment here. Normally, when you shine a light in a horse's eye, you should get like a nice bright blue or green or pink sort of shine back out. Horses with ERU in the back of their eye, if you shine like your phone light or a flashlight in there, it looks like dirty green pond water like really gross looking dirty green pond water. Anytime the back of your horse's eye looks like dirty green pond water, something's going very, very wrong. <laughs> the, the form of ERU that affects the front of the eye is much easier to recognize because most of the time horses with ERU in the front of their eye are really squinty and maybe having tears coming out of that eye and might even show you some really dramatic changes like a color change of the iris. So remember what I told you at the beginning, that the only normal colors for an iris are blue and brown. Okay, so look here, see this horse's iris? It's yellow. That's not normal. <laughs> That's not normal at all. And the reason that it looks yellow is because the liquid part of horse's blood is actually yellow. So blood has two parts, the cells, like red blood cells, and then serum, which is the liquid part of the blood. And because horses eat a very beta carotene rich diet, right, they eat a lot of forage, their serum, the liquid part of their blood is actually yellow. Fun fact, the fat in their abdomen is also yellow colored because of their diet and the beta carotene in their diet. So when you have a blue eyed horse, who's having uveitis, you have some of that blood inside the eye, and then you can see that kind of yellow color to the iris itself. So anytime you walk out to the barn and your formerly blue-eyed horse now has a yellow iris, time to get a veterinarian on the phone. Unfortunately, ERU is the most common cause of blindness in horses, and it causes blindness by causing damage to the tissue inside the eye and including things like cataracts. You can see the lens here is white, 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 like a piece of paper. Uh, it can make the lens fall out of place. It can make the retina detach and it can actually make the whole eye scar down into a small little shrunken up nub of an eye. While ERU, we might not know the exact precise mechanism, we do know that certain kinds of Appaloosas are more likely to get ERU. So leopard appies and leopard appies who have more white on their body are definitely predisposed to developing ERU. 
So if you are the owner of a leopard Appaloosa, particularly one that's got more of this kind of coat pattern, whether than just a small blanket, you really need to keep a close eye on your horse's eyes, no pun intended. And you need to make sure that your veterinarian, when they come out for your vaccines twice a year, or however often you're doing vaccines, that your, your horse is getting their eyes looked at. Because we know that those horses tend to get the kind of ERU that happens in the back of the eye, which is the kind that's harder to detect. And we know that this particular coat pattern is definitely predisposed. So you need to keep a closer eye on those horses. So we're winding down to the end here. And I want to leave you with some practical tips that you can take into the barn with you this afternoon. And the first thing I want to talk about is how do you know when your horse is having an eye problem, right? Because I'm sure after listening to all this, you're going to go out to the barn, you're going to look really close at your horse's eyes and be like, oh, is this normal? I don't know. Oh, is that a tumor? Nope, it's corporate eye because you learned that this morning. So the big signs of eye problems in horses, if they're having lots of tears coming out of their eye, or discharge out of their eye, whether that's a yellow or green or grayish or just clear tears like this, this is the sign of an eye problem. Also squinting, so not holding the eye open but the eye either all the way shut or a little bit shut is also a sign of eye pain and having an eye problem. Any cloudiness or change in the color inside of the eye is also um, signs of an eye problem and anytime you notice a change in vision so if you're totally reliable totally bomb proof 24 year old trail horse all of a sudden won't walk out of one particular part of the barn or one particular gate that kind of behavior change is definitely something you need to talk to a veterinarian about also a change in the size of the pupil i know that i'm an ophthalmologist and i'm obsessed with eyes I look at my dog's eyes every day, and if I had a horse, I'd look at their eye every day too, and you don't need anything fancy. You can literally just get your smartphone and flip your flashlight on and just shine it in there so that you have a really good internal sense of what's normal for your horse. Just the way that you feel their legs, just the way that you pick out their feet, just the way that, you know, when you're petting your horse and you feel a blue lump that wasn't there before, I would really encourage you to just make looking at your horse's eyes and understanding what's normal for your horse part of your daily routine. What do you do when you think your horse has an eye problem? Well, you call your veterinarian. I promise you, I promise you, veterinarians always wanna see your eye problem sooner rather than later. Because remember those really terrible pictures I showed you of like infected and melting corneas? You can go from something that's gonna be pretty cheap and easy to treat to something like that in 12 hours. Like I have seen it happen myself with horses I had in the hospital. So if you are even remotely concerned about your horse's eyes, please, 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 please call a veterinarian. We are never, ever, ever, ever mad to be able to go out and see a horse with an eye problem because we know that they can be time sensitive. How do you protect your horse's eyes? Okay, this is the last thing we're gonna talk about. Some really, really cheap, really accessible things that you can do every single day to reduce the risk of your horse developing eye problems. So first off, walk around your barn walk around your barn and run your hands over the walls run your hands over the sides of the stalls be on the lookout for displaced nails and broken boards and things that are pokey that could potentially cause your horse to have an eye injury also tape up those bucket hooks man those things are just absolutely the worst do not leave those little upturned bucket hooks around um put some duct tape on them make sure that anything your horse wears is appropriately fitted. I have seen some really nasty corneal ulcers from those stretchy, sleazy, slinky things like horse spandex getting like cattywampus on their head and then rubbing on the surface of their eye. Also, I do absolutely advocate for the use of fly masks in all horses who are turned out and out in the paddock or out in a dry lot, but you gotta take them off at least twice a day, okay? The worst thing is when the horse has been out in the pasture for a few days 
wearing the same fly mask and they come in to get fed or they come in to ride and you take the fly mask off and there's a bunch of pus coming out of the eye because they've got a terrible, nasty, infected corneal wound, okay? Fly masks are great. They're great for protection. They're great for reducing irritation from flies and reducing diseases like habernema, but you gotta take them off and you gotta look underneath them. Again, that's cheap, that's easy to do, and it's something that can make a big difference in detecting eye problems early. Really high level stuff, like this is what the A plus clients out there are gonna do, is do some conditioning work to help your horse accept having their eyes touched. Simple things like being able to rub over their eyelids and using your fingers to gently open their eye, you are going to thank yourself for the time that you put in helping them learn to accept that handling if and when you ever have to administer eye medication to them. All right, friends, those are all of the slides I prepared for you. I'm popping over here to the chat and uh, there's a question from someone who had a dog with progressive retinal atrophy who wants to know if horses get diseases like progressive retinal atrophy. That is a really super good question. So progressive retinal atrophy is a disease where the retina slowly degenerates. So the rods and the cones, the light sensing cells in the retina, slowly degenerate over time. And because the retina is a structure made of nerves, and nerves are not very good at regenerating themselves. Like, like we, skin is really good at regenerating itself and liver is really good at regenerating itself, but nerves like in your spinal cord and your brain aren't very good at regenerating your, themselves. So dogs with progressive retinal atrophy have a slow and steady decline in vision. Their, the short answer is no. No, we don't really recognize the kind of retinal degeneration and PRA that we see in dogs in horses, but they do get some other genetic diseases of their retina. For example, there's a disease of Appaloosa called congenital stationary night blindness or CSNB, where those horses are born without the cells that allow them to see in dim lighting conditions. And so they're functionally blind in the dark, but can see pretty darn well when the lights are on. That's a form of um, retinal disease that's kind of in the same idea as progressive retinal atrophy, but the specific genetic forms of progressive retinal atrophy that we see in dogs, we do not see in horses. Okay, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I can see myself now. And I'm gonna say anybody who wants to drop a question in the chat, anybody who um wants to unmute and ask a question uh i have someone in the chat who is apologizing for their english and i am going to say i reject your apology because if you write in another language and you can write in english that is really darn cool and as someone who lives in a very multilingual community with bilingual children and a bilingual husband I sure wish I had good command of more than one language. So Jenna, I think you're awesome and you're doing great. You wanted to know how many completely blind horses have a normal life. So this is a really good question. So it depends on the horse. It depends on their housing situation and it depends on the person that owns them. So do I know some really happy 35 year old totally blind horses that have lived on the same farm for 35 years and who are really good at ambling around their small flat paddock and maybe coming into the barn every now and again. Yes, yes. I, I'm thinking of this one particular chestnut Arab horse that I saw earlier this year that like that horse has a great quality of life. He's very confident. His owner is very competent in handling him. And I would say he's very safe, both in terms of his personal safety and safe for the people that are around him. I'm also thinking of another patient that I saw this year who was a young off the track thoroughbred who had a sudden cause of blindness. And the owners in that case elected for euthanasia. 
um, because that horse's cause of blindness was irreversible and his temperament and his living situation was such that he was dangerous both to himself and to the people around him. So I don't think there's a, a single blanket answer to this question. I think that there are some horses who can have a good quality of life and who can be safe for the people around them. But that's not the case with every horse. And I would far rather, far rather choose a humane and compassionate and peaceful end to a horse's life who presents a major danger to themselves and the people around them than to let them suffer. So I hope I hope that that answers your question. If you have any follow up questions, you're welcome to put that in the chat. Any other questions out there? Okay, well, actually, um, we did talk about one question that I found last night. Let me see if I can get it up here. So um, Dr. King was our May presenter, mm -hmm. and she spoke to us about, um, we call the equine mythbusters, how to dive mm -hmm. deep into the information that we're seeing and mm -hmm. assess it. So this is a, a question that she posted coincidentally yesterday, and I thought it was perfect timing for our, our seminar. Um, in terms, you know, wild horses, we're used to seeing them and they have these tiny fringy little forelocks and um, short manes and tails. And we like to encourage domesticated horses to have these long, luxuriant forelocks and everything. But if we think about when we get an eyelash in our eye, it's fairly irritating. Um, how does having longer forelocks could that compromise vision? Is there something that we should do in terms of grooming to maintain that so it doesn't become an issue? Can you speak to that a little bit? Definitely. Um, yes. Like, yes, absolutely. If you have a big bushy forelock and you can't see the eyes very well, then yes, it's absolutely going to impact vision. Um, how much is it going to impact vision? I really wish I could get a horse to read an eye chart for sure. Um, would I go cross country on a horse with its forelock completely covering its face like we see in this picture? Definitely not, <laughs> like, definitely not. But you know, is having a bushy forelock gonna affect your ability to get out in the pasture and graze? Probably not, probably not. Um, I, I think about what we know about dogs that have lots of fuzzy hair over their eyes. And I think about the fact that very often owners end up clipping their hair up in a top knot in order for them to be able to navigate around. I would imagine that, yes, yeah, so having a big bushy forelock could definitely interfere with vision. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so it sounds like we are blessed in Illinois to have the University of Illinois Vet Med School, and they would be a really good call for um, and something that is super complicated. So I guess my question is, how do we find someone like you in our own area? What is there a minimum um I'm trying to figure out, I have so many questions, where to start? Um, so <laughs> how, how do you find a veterinary ophthalmologist for your horse? Is that your question? Yes, that, that is, okay. um, you know, and kind of when do we need to uh, ask our vet to maybe reach out to a specialist is where I was going. With Got that. it. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So um, if you want to find a veterinary ophthalmologist in your area, you can go to acvo.org. Actually, let me just double check that. We, uh, yep, acvo.org, and there is a tool there where you can find the veterinary ophthalmologist close to you, and you can sort by the species that they see. Um, your veterinarian, your primary care veterinarian, is always your first 
sort of line of defense against eye problems of horses. And so you want to start with them. And I think, I think the question of when you need a specialist is, it's not a question with just one answer. It's the kind of question where you ideally have the kind of relationship with your veterinarian that the two of you decide together that now is the right time to involve a veterinary ophthalmologist. And um, I'm wishing for each and every one of you that you have that kind of trusting relationship where you can be honest with each other and you might be able to say, you know, I'm really worried about this. And your veterinarian can say, I'm really worried about this. Let's see if we need to get a specialist involved. Um, often primary care veterinarians will reach out to an ophthalmologist first and say, hey, I've got this horse that I saw on the farm. Here's some photos of the eyes. Here's what I'm worried about. And then in consultation with the specialist, we'll decide whether the horse needs to be seen by a specialist. Um, a place where an owner might reach out to a specialist directly would be if you're doing a pre-purchase exam. You might request to have an ophthalmologist examine a horse, um, A, if you're worried about their vision, or B, if a veterinarian who might not be your primary care vet finds an eye abnormality, getting a, a veterinary ophthalmologist involved in a pre-purchase exam um, can be very prudent and prevent some expensive mistakes. Excellent. Are there any specific resources that you could recommend, either websites or publications, for us to keep up with research in the equine eye and just learn more? Mm -hmm. The American Association of Equine Practitioners publishes a magazine called The Horse, which I think is a really wonderful resource. Um, full of very reputable information. Also, the AAEP has a website full of resources for horse owners um, and that is very trustworthy and reputable information. And then, of course, your veterinarian. <laughs> like, your veterinarian is also a really excellent source of information. Uh, the internet is not always a great source of information. So if you read something on the internet that you're like, hmm, I wonder if this magic potion will actually cure my horse's eyes, I highly recommend you talking to your veterinarian about it um, so that you can evaluate the trustworthiness of the claims on that product together. I can see that we had a couple of the questions pop, pop up in the chat. The first one was, if a horse has a corneal ulcer and uveitis at the same time, could it be due to one cause or could it be caused by systemic disease? This is a really good question because corneal ulcers can actually cause uveitis and having uveitis and being painful might be a reason for a horse to rub and give themselves a corneal ulcer. Um, so I would say a really good detailed eye exam is gonna be critical for kind of figuring out that chicken versus egg scenario and figuring out who came first? And the second question was, do we have an equivalent to e-collars for horses? So when a dog or a cat has a major eye problem, often we'll end up putting them in one of those cones, you know, the cone of shame. Uh, we don't have cones for horses, but they do make a couple of different kind of protective devices. So there are like fly masks that have some kind of reinforced cups. There's a fly mask type thing that has a hard plastic cup. And then sometimes just partial, um, like the hoods they use on racehorses can provide a little bit of hard outer protection, but also still allow the horse to see out. And then I don't know if you saw in my presentation, there was a handsome bay horse who was wearing this like UV visor thing over his bridle. Um, I've had some folks use those kind of long term as well. Is that necessary for every kind of horse with every kind of eye problem? No, definitely not. I think where we're going to be reaching for more levels of protection are going to be horses that have really deep or really fragile corneal wounds where we really don't want them banging their head on something. Whereas, um, you know, like your average horse that we're managing with like, let's say chronic ERU or moon blindness, 
you know, most of those horses are just going to be fine in a fly mask and don't need, you know, like hard cups over their eyes all the time. That's a really good question. Thank you. There's some, been some awesome questions out of this group. Wonderful. Well, we have one question that we traditionally ask all of our speakers, and hmm. that is, what was your favorite book as a child? It may be one that inspired you to pursue your career or one that just, you know, that you remember off the top of your head. I am a voracious reader and I was a voracious reader as a child and my local library had a horse section and I read every single book in that section. I have read everything Marguerite Henry has ever written. Um, but my very favorite book as like an elementary schooler is a book called The Heavenly Horse from the Outermost West. And it's a fantasy novel about like a romance between an Appaloosa stallion and like a buckskin mare, I think. I think she was a buckskin mare. And there's epic battles between good and evil. And man, I gotta get a copy of that book. I hadn't read that book in decades, but I loved it as a kid. Absolutely loved it. Can I tell you the book I hated most as a kid too? Yes. Of course. Freaking John Steinbeck's The Red Pony. That was the most depressing book I'd ever read. And I remember being super excited because I was like, oh, this is a book about horses. And like the kid's horse gets strangles and dies. Like it was awful, awful. Do not recommend The Red Pony. Definitely recommend The Heavenly Horse from the Outermost West. Outermost West. I've never heard of that. I have to go find I'm, it now. I'm sure it's not in print. I mean, that, that book is old <laughs> at this point. <laughs> well, Dr. LaBelle, thank you so much for joining us today. This was so interesting and informative. I cannot appreciate tell you how much we appreciate it. And oh, we were talking honor. Before, it really is. before we started how small the equine veterinary world is that Dr. Golden last month, who did a wonderful presentation on gastric ulcer syndrome, we were chatting afterwards and I said, Oh, I see, you know, ophthalmology is one of the areas that you know you either mentioned in your website. Um, would you be interested next year? And she's like, well, I can, but you really want Dr. LaBelle. <laughs> oh, Dr. So Goldstein I, is I love the fabulous the connections that we have um, in the equine veterinary world. And we appreciate so much that you were here with us today. So we have posted your contact information and people can follow you on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And that is phone, email, and website. Next month, we will be talking about winter barn preparation. Yes, it's October, but we have had snow here in October in Illinois. And this also gives you hopefully at least a month to work on some projects and get your barn ready for the glorious winter that we have here in Illinois. And I'm sure Dr. LaBelle, you may actually have some great suggestions having to manage even further north. Horse keeping here in Canada is a very different experience than where I grew up in the Sonoran Desert. And the two most important things that I've learned from the horse community here about keeping horses warm in the winter is number one, making sure they have hay in front of them at all times because if they're eating they're generating internal body heat and that helps keep them warm and then making sure they always have access to water and using um safe heating tools and making sure that that at all times they have access to hay and water and that goes a huge long ways towards keeping them healthy and warm in the cold wonderful We'll make sure that we add those to our discussion in the Facebook event when we post this in just a few minutes on our Facebook page.
And then for anyone on who is local to us in Northern Illinois, Haas is based in Woodstock. We have a few events coming up. Our fall festival is next Saturday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. The following week, we are really pleased to be hosting the Illinois Fire Service Institute and the Woodstock Fire Rescue Department for large animal rescue awareness training. So we all know that the horses spend 11 months coming into the world and the next hopefully 20 to 30 years trying to get out of it in the most creative and possibly destructive ways imaginable. So as you can see from some of the pictures, um, we will be learning from the University of Illinois Fire Service Institute, just the very basics of large animal rescue. I know the, the one tidbit that I always love sharing about this is the human skeleton and the equine skeleton can be matched bone for bone, except for one bone. So they are identical skeletons, except for one bone. And when you share that with first responders who are used to extricating people from accidents and everything, boom the light bulb goes on and they're like oh got it so um please join us for that that is an in-person event at our farm we welcome you from anywhere and we will also be offering on the same day we're doing a dime to donate fundraiser with our local chipotle and we will be bringing lunch in after our training session so we look forward to seeing you next month for winter barn preparation or on the farm in the next couple of weeks. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. LaBelle, and I hope that when you make a trip back to the U.S., you would consider swinging through Illinois and stopping by to say hi. <laughs> I would love that. Wonderful. We hope everyone enjoys beautiful weather that you're hopefully having wherever you are. And thank you to everyone who joined us, especially Jana, who joined us from the Czech Republic today. We are so excited that not only do we have international presenters, but we have international participants. We're so glad you found us and we look forward to seeing you all next month. Have a great week, everybody. <laughs>